So I'm here with Steve and Amaris and Max and Anna and Jason and Dave and Emily and Lily, and we're here to talk about A Taste of Liquor Never Brewed, um, a poem by Emily Dickinson. And I'll read the poem, and then what I'm going to do is uh, assign phrases and words to each of us to do a kind of collective close reading. This is a poem that's wide open, um, and we'll talk about how specifically wide it is, but one can do all kinds of different readings of this poem. So we're going to offer several, but not all. Uh, Just wanted to to put that out there. Okay, I'm going to read the poem, then assign the parts. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the vats upon the Rhine yield such an alcohol. Inebriate of air am I, and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue, when landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. Okay, so, uh, Amaris, you have Liquor Never Brewed, right? Um, Steve, you have the eye, eye taste, eye. Mm-hmm. Max, you have Tankard Scooped in Pearl and the Vats Upon the Rhine Yield Such an Alcohol. You have those the three next lines. <laughs> Have fun with that. Okay. Anna, you have inebriate of air. Am I? You can have that line. All right. Jason, you have you can have debauchee of dew, although it's going to be quick. I hope you don't mind because it's similar to the previous line. So uh, why don't I also give you reeling through endless summer days. No, actually, we've got to separate that. So you've got debauchee of dew. And Dave, you've got reeling through endless summer days from Inns of Molten Blue. Emily, you have landlords turning out the drunken bees out of the foxglove's door, and you have butterflies renouncing their drams, and I shall but drink them more. Yeah, okay. Um, and Steve, you have the I in I shall but drink them more. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and Lily, you have Sarah swinging snowy hats and saints to windows run, and we'll all together do um, the little tippler leaning against the sun. Um, okay, here we go. Amaris. Liquor never brewed? Is that possible? I mean, obviously not. So from the outset, Dickinson is plainly stating that this is not a literal alcohol, but a metaphorical one. So one, one interpretation, the fancy Amaris-ish interpretation, is that it's not real liquor. It's an imaginary liquor. Right. right? Or, yeah. What's the plainer not, pre-Amaris uh, reading? Come on, be literal. You're so not literal. Um, liquor never brewed. Anna, what's a liquor never brewed? Uh, a liquor that has not yet been brewed. Has not yet been brewed? <laughs> See, Anna knows all about this, having spent time at St. Andrews. No, they had, they had, there they had liquor that was brewed, but you could imagine liquor that like hadn't been brewed yet. And what about, um, is there another literal reading of liquor never brewed? Anybody? It hasn't been brewed at all. It's, it can't be brewed. It's not no. right. It's not. It's not to be brewed. So that would be a paradox because liquor is assume we assume that liquor has is liquored. Okay, but let's go back to your first reading. Why would you say such a thing? Why would anyone drink a liquor that's never been brewed? Well, I mean, I, I think she's teasing the reader because we obviously need to learn what is the true source of her intoxication. Yeah, good. Very good. Okay, Max. So she drinks this... Oh, Steve, you have the eye. There's a speaker in this poem. Do we know who it, she, he is? Uh, it would strike me here that it's uh, likely Emily Dickinson. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a... <laughs> no, no, he, don't laugh at him. He really means that, right? This yeah. is a Dickinsonian eye. Sure, yeah. It's uh, uh, one of many poems by Dickinson in which she's, she's setting herself apart from society. We're describing the ways in which she doesn't quite fit in. So Steve's already gone, I mean, invited by me, I'm not blaming you, but he's gone for the meta reading, right? The, the, this is a meta-poetic poem where the, narr- the speaker is saying something about, well, according to Amaris, the, the liquor never brewed is a, a stand-in for, what, the imagination? Um, perhaps. She's or, going to unpack that. Or poetry or literature. Right. Thought, right. yeah. So, so there, that's good, that's good on the eye. All right, Max, uh, f- so she drinks this liquor never brewed from a certain kind of tanker 
and she makes a claim, a comparative claim about vats upon the Rhine. Explain this, Max. Well, it's a it's a superlative uh, description in a way. She's saying that this <coughs> that What's this liquor comes from a well, it comes from a, a pearl tankard, so a very glamorous sort of. Uh, barrel in which it's 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 well, aged a tankard and fermented. Isn't a barrel, Max. You need to spend a semester abroad. Okay. <laughs> what's a tank? <laughs> what's okay, a tankard? Like, it's like a big mug. Anna, you've what? spent a semester. What's a tankard? Teach Max because he does, Max is uh, never drinks. I, I never. Drink. <laughs> it's like you know those um like a beer stein. You know, big it's a stein. Aha, yeah. yeah. A tankard is a stein. A tankard. It's not a tanker. It's a tankard. Sure. It's a stein, and it's scooped in pearl, which means. Real fancy. It's it's un- unimaginably it's a, it's fancy. It's impossible. Yeah, it's an impossibly <laughs> fancy. Okay, not all the vats upon the Rhine yield such an alcohol. What's she saying there, Max? Well, she's saying that even the best uh, alcohol-producing region in the world can't produce this liquor. The Rhine, the Rhine, the Rhine River. Yeah, the Rhine Valley. So you get, you get German wine and German beer. I think we probably mean beer here, although it's not clear. Right? But could be both. It's appropriate because tankard. Sure. Yeah. yeah, tankard is more beer-like. Although, in a, in a, a bowlerized, awful version of this poem, someone who wrote it, they added Frankfurt berries, <laughs> which suggests a German wine. Actually, yeah. So it's not clear whether it's beer or wine. The point is that Emily doesn't know anything about this sort of thing, so it's okay for her to mix things up because what she's saying, Max, go ahead and say it. Well, that this. It's an imaginary liquor, so it doesn't really it doesn't matter. matter. I, yeah, you know, I, I taste. I'm I'm high on something else. Okay, and that leads us to Anna, inebriate of air dash m i dash. You gotta love inebriate, um, because what, what part of speech is that? Well, it's funny. It's kind of here. It functions as a noun. Yes, she's an inebriate. Yeah. It could be an adjective, but it's probably a noun. Here it's a She's noun. She's making that. Uh, has but anybody could, ever used that word? But it could be two kinds of noun, nouns. It could be inebriate as in the beer or inebriated. Uh, well, she, she's a a, she inebriated. is inebriated, therefore, therefore she's an inebriate. But it's, it's kind of a neologism. It's kind of a made-up word. probably is. Or at least, uh, I mean, the word itself, like, it, to be it? inebriated is not made up, but in this to usage. To be an inebriate, it, I, I mean, I'm saying this for the first time because I've been reading this poem for many years and i never thought of this until now so it's probably way off but inebriate it almost it's almost like she's an initiate she's almost like signed on Mm. to the cult of drink (laughs) getting high on imagination inebriate of air go ahead am i go ahead anna so she's not an inebriate on this liquor that she's been talking about she's an inebriate on the air like the very just like air that surrounds her yeah so um when you run into uh as you probably do, when you run into someone who doesn't drink at a party, one of the things they say when you say, why aren't you drinking? Applying peer pressure, as Anna does. What, 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 um, what does the non-alcoholic say? Uh, I don't need to drink to have fun. Because I'm high, high on, life. on life. I mean, in a way, in a way, Emily Dickinson saying, I'm high on X. It's not liquor. I don't need my liquor. I'm high on inebriate of air, am I? All right, one more thing bef- before we turn to Jason. Why does she set up an, an inversion of the grammar of a normal sentence, English sentence? Inebriate of air, am I? Anna is I don't know. I think it, stumped. I think. I'm not stumped. I'm a little stumped. I'm a little bit stumped. Why is she turning it around? Well... I mean, she's making the ballad meter work. That's one thing. Well, think about how it would be if you, if you flipped it. I am dash inebriate of air, inebriate and it, of would, air. it would lose the noun it would, sense of yeah, it. It would really lose part. that emphasis on yeah. the inebriate. Like that's yes. that's the key word. Yeah, but but come on, come on! I'm going to push you. What? What? Why would she do this? Because she's Emily and she can. <laughs> yeah, she's Emily and she can. That's right. She likes to mess around. And, and, it, and it allows you to doing that. It lets you offset the inebriate of air and the mi. This is the first separate. time something odd has happened. Uh, in the poem, we've got four lines that function f- grammatically and syntactically somewhat normally in the first stanza. It's a pretty good ballad stanza. And now we get something screwed up. So she's so getting Dave, drunk. You, yeah, she's, re- <laughs> she's beginning to show it. This is the first indication we have that the poet writing these lines is a little off. She's a little high. Inebriate of air. Oh, she almost forgot the subject and the predicate. 
uh, am I? Just a hint. And the dashes reinforce that. No? Right. Yeah. Okay. Jason, debauchee, which I deliberately pronounce so that it's not French. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting it wrong. What? That's some word, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I take it almost in the same way that when, when you say inebriate, it almost pulls in the idea of initiate. I want de- debauche, or Yeah, you debauche. can say de- debauche. Um, Comes from what word? Uh, from de- debauched. Yeah, or, or a noun, or debauchery. debauchery. Yeah. We say debauchery from New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. We say debauchery. I'm from New Jersey. We well, then you should say well, it. We don't say it. It's already. It. We don't say it. <laughs> it, need, it need not be there said. There is no debauchery in New Jersey. And you've right. heard that first here. <laughs> right. No, no. It's, it's permeated so that it's like a it's, fish in it's water. A, it's, so, it's so real that nobody uh-huh. actually has to name it. Right. <laughs> um, but I was thinking that... that We're going to get a lot of complaints from people from New Jersey. We're Amaris, from New will Jersey. you answer all, all right. of those emails? I'm from New Jersey, and I agree fully with Jason. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm high on work. New Jersey. I don't need to drink. Um, the, do you, but, but I take that as being still... Uh, yes, we're flipping around the, the syntax. I mean, we could read it in a Yoda voice, and it would sound... Yoda syntax. Can you do a Yoda voice? No, I cannot. <laughs> um, oh, I see. Like Yoda says things like, um, "An apprentice you are." That or, kind of thing. He, that wasn't bad, was it? That's awful. <laughs> <laughs> or, or an apprentice, uh, or or an, an, an inebriate of air are you? He might say. Yeah, he might say that, uh, right. but in a way that is to play. This is with the Yoda reading of Emily Dickinson. <laughs> By the way, for those who are listening to this and don't know what the reference is, this is Yoda is the diminutive Uh, guru in Star Wars who is everybody's. Did I? Yes. Diminutive guru. Okay. Yeah, that's the. Yeah, he's the the teacher. He's the master. He's the. He's got the force. Okay. The force is strong. But the thing is, is that and like in M I we, it's a question as much as an answer, as much as a statement. But But that that was Anna's line. Can you do your line? (laughs) Sure. But that uh <laughs> of of do though wants me that that I taste a liquor never brewed could also be dare I say it water turned to wine, which would not require brewing. And so in a sense the entire uh the dew itself is in intoxicating and mm-hmm. has turned into a true intoxicant. What kind of liquid is dew? D E W, great word. It is the condensation of vapor uh, in the morning. Yes, in the on morning. The grass. In the yeah. morning, and we will get it in the evening sometime. But what happens to do? It evaporates very quickly. Yeah. It's very ephemeral. Mm-hmm. So she is, she's creating a beautiful Dickinsonian paradox here. She's she's got it. There's been a debauchery of I love the of of this ephemeral barely there got to get up early to see it water so she's really creating this she's creating a rough gross debauchery out of this thin uh quickly disappeared ephemerality and uh so what is that saying final thought very quickly jason what's that saying generally about either this poem or what emily dickinson is doing with poetry it is to take something and then spin it away so that um, anything can kind of re- uh, move into its place. But but even if we take debauche as a kind of debutante or, or these initiates, these we're inebriated and, and debauched, but also kind of initiated into this um, ephemerality, this, this uh, rapture of, of ephemerality. Mm-hmm. All right, good. We're going to come back to that. Dave, now, she is reeling, I think, right? Who's reeling? Well, the speaker is reeling, but right. the, the entire poem is mm-hmm. really escalating, and the entire poem... What is, is reeling? Reeling is... It's quite a word. It's going back and forth, and I think it's funny... Mm, say more. Well, well it, it's it's stumbling, and here's where, where the poem is starting if to... If you are reeling... You are stumbling. 
You are not walking a straight line. What else? You're also shocked and transported by some type of emotion. Yeah, you could be reeling from the news that yeah. someone you love has passed. Impacted. Yeah. And Isn't a reel also a dance? The reel, of course, dance? is a dance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think this is more like the drunken reeling. Go ahead, Dave. And the poem is escalating itself. It's building to the point where she may even be hallucinating here. You see molten blue. Uh, you're not sure what she's seeing, if that's something from the Endless Summer where, Days. What's, the scene and, has shifted now. Where are and, we? And Well, we're not, even, we're not even sure. When she talks about from inns of molten blue, I think you could read the inn as a, as a play on words to mean in where she's going from in. She doesn't know if she's coming or going. Ah, she's reeling in, back in and forth. I-N-N as I-N. Yeah. That's good. Can you be a little more literalistic? We're in, we seem to be in two places now. The, the, the poem begins, and it's not clear where we are. She's stating something and comparing it. Then, now we are reeling through somewhere. So, where is that? Endless summer days. What do we do with that? Through days. When we say through days, what kind of conception is that, Max? What kind of conception is that? It's a, it's a temporal conception. It's a temporal yeah. conception. So, she's reeling through days. Endless summer days. Why endless, Dave? Well, time time is standing still. Time is everywhere. No, right be, now. be 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 uh, be a temperate zone kind of guy. What's summer? What is summer like? Summer is warm, sunny, temperate. Yes, but, uh, it's true. What <laughs> else is it? Days are long. Yeah, it's the longest yeah, days. Yeah. So endless summer days is a lot of light reeling through endless summer days. And now we shift from ends of molten blue. Where are we? Well, if you know what's coming, you know you're in a flower. <laughs> okay, yeah, but, but we're not there yet because Emily is reeling and we have to just go with the conceit, the figure, as it's shifting. This is the great thing about Emily Dickinson, as we've said before. She, she is never satisfied with the conceit that she's constructed and she will change it and shift it constantly. So, th- endless summer days, we are in day, we are temporarily in a summer day, but ends of molten blue. Go ahead, where are ends of molten blue? I see that as the sky. Yeah, molten blue. Why molten? I just find that as a fun contrast, especially when she's maybe not seeing clearly. But Dave, like what is molten? Molten's hot. Hot. And why is it hot? It's summer. It's summer. And if you go up in the sky, it's hot. So she seems to be in the sky. Okay, what are in, why inns? What are inns? What's an inn? An inn is a, a public house where you can go grab a drink. Yeah, so it's like a tavern, mm-hmm. a way station along the way. This would be a word that Emily would use in the 19th century to refer to a bar. Okay, so, sh- and what do we do in bars? We drink. So, she's reeling through the sky, and the sky is like the bars. She's, she's bar hopping in the summer sky. She's really reeling. What do you think? Dave, you're smiling. Yeah, the entire yeah, Emily sky is, is wild. Her bar. Yeah. She's wild. <laughs> she's, she's so drunk that she is bar hopping in the summer sky. Okay. So, speaking of Emily, um, so now we continue this conceit, but it shifts. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. What's she saying? She's saying, in a sense, that her intoxication, this natural sort of inebriate of air intoxication, is both more natural and more potent than other sort of natural intoxicants than wow, butterflies. Wow, so you did, this, you did a paraphrase right from the start. Now let's look closely at it. Who are the landlords? I was going to ask you that. Who okay. are they? <laughs> Anybody who's a landlord? Um, barkeep, Maurice? Right? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Max, he's, he's the barkeep, mean, typically, the innkeep. Yes. Uh, the landlord is the guy who runs the tavern, the inn. Okay, Emily, go ahead. So, so this is, is a foxglove a bar or is it a flower? That's the foxglove <laughs> is a it's flower, a flower. Although I've been to some bars named the foxglove, but no. Right. Not so, really. Um, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> working with that. It's you know, what? Yeah. So, well, the foxglove is actually medicinal. Medicinal. Yeah, it's sort of the opposite. But um, when landlords turn the drunken bee out of the door, what's, ha- what are the, what's the barkeep doing? Barkeep is kicking the overly drunk person out of... No, not a person. The, the bee. A the bee. bee. Now, yeah. why would a bee be drunk in the summer? Amaris, have you looked at the bees? No, yeah, yeah. but I was yeah. team on nectar. You have not looked at the I bees. Will. You're too busy studying. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> why, why would you... Um, wh- what do bees do? 
Um, well, they take the ne nectar from flower to flower, so this, is, I think, is referring to the change of seasons. If you ever put nectar out in, in the hot weather, like you have a bird feeder for hummingbirds, for instance, um, if, it's out in the, if it's out in the sun for a couple of hours, it ferments, and the, the hummingbirds start to, whoa, they get kind of <laughs> drunk. All right, so the, dr the, bees, the bees have been drinking a lot of nectar, Emily, mm -hmm. and so what is the landlord doing? He kicks them right out of the flower. Why? Because they're... What does he say to them? You're behaving in a disorderly fashion. Oh, and you nobody has ever flower. said that. <laughs> you are behaving... In, maybe you, Emily. You are behaving in a disorderly fashion. You shall commence to depart. No. What, what, be, be a landlord, Emily. Use a landlord voice and tell me what's being said. Um, get your drunk be self out of my flower. <laughs> I could, I could. Yeah, you've had, a, yeah. you've had too much. We're cutting you off. You need to leave. Mm -hmm. You're too drunk. Okay. So when landlords do that, but this is a double metaphor, right? We are in the sky. It's a hot sky. She's bar hopping in the hot sky, and she's hanging. There's Emily on a stool next to a bee, and the bee is saying, "I'm really drunk, <laughs> bee." And the and the landlord, the landlord says, "I'm a," in quotes, landlord. Why does she put landlords in quotes? It's weird. I'm surprised by it. Why is she doing it? Lily? Sort of like questioning their position of authority because I think the greater implication is that they they don't have... It's not her landlord. It's like the landlord of this Supposedly, inn I'm talking about. So-called landlord. Yeah, he doesn't I mean, have That's a sophisticated to. reading. There's another reading of it, which is simply that she's saying... Well, you get me here. I'm Emily Dickinson, and I'm kind of making things up as I go along. And so I don't really mean landlords. I'm being metaphorical. Landlords, do you get it? There's, I'm, I'm using, uh, what do we call this? Scare quotes. Scare, scare quotes. quotes. Uh, no, air, air quotes. <laughs> These are air quotes. Or scare quotes. Um, so when landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, <laughs> the bees are in the flower, but metaphorically we're in a bar but we're in the sky. She has really lost it. Emily Dickinson has lost it. She is reeling through this poem. This is the most important thing one could say about an Emily Dickinson poem. The poem enacts exactly its content. This is what modern poetry does. The form of the poem does what the content is saying is happening to the speaker. The speaker is saying, I got drunk, but most people, pre-moderns, who write about getting drunk or being high on life, they will write a poem that they've written when they are sober again, and they will write a conventional poem which does not convey the drunkenness. Emily Dickinson is all about reeling through the poem, and she's using drunkenness as a metaphor, and she's spinning through her metaphors, abandoning them quickly as soon as she picks them up. So you have the next two lines, I believe, too. When mm -hmm. butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. Yeah. Um... She's saying that she can drink butterflies under the table, clearly. Definitely. <laughs> um, That's what she's saying. Yeah. Butterflies are not being kicked out. They're doing what? They're, they're saying they're done. I can't you know. do it. <laughs> Emily, you, I, I, <laughs> I, you're just, Emily, you are a beast. I can't do it. <laughs> and Emily's like, yeah, the bees got kicked out and the butterflies have given up. And so we're going to turn to Steve for a second to tell us about the I, but what is she saying? I shall but drink the more. When all this happens... I'm like, bartender, more metaphors, please. <laughs> She's the only one left standing, including us, because we are so lost at this point. We are reeling. Okay, Steve, what about the eye there? The eye shall but drink the more. What, what are you driving at with the eye? So it's I, Emily, or the, the poet, or people like Emily, or some... Uh, undecidable um, speaking subject in the poem. Uh, yeah, I mean, are you asking me what I'm driving at? <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Let's talk about the I and I tasted liquor never brewed. What, what, who is the speaker of this poem so far, in, given our close reading? Is it a person who is a poet? Do we have evidence that the speaker of this poem is a poet? Well, the, the composer of the poem certainly is a poet. I the composer of the poem is a poet because we're reading a poem. Mm -hmm. The person in the story who gets drunk... Is that person a poet? Who is that person? Well, I would I would hazard a guess yes, but I mean this could be about a uh, caterpillar. Um. <laughs> well, well, no. What if? It, <laughs> are you mocking me? What? What if? Amaris, Amaris, 
what if this the poem is written by Emily Dickinson, who is a poet, and in that sense, Steve is of course right that the I is a poet. But what if the I is a person who is high on life, who's right? It's a right, Steve. It's a story about it's a story about a person who's reeling through an experience. But it's also because she tastes a liquor never brewed. She's talking about what she does. Emily Dickinson, as you said before. And what she does is like this. And this is an example of what she does. Okay, so, um, Lily, you have the last, next two lines. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats, great line, and saints to windows run. What's happening? Um, Well... As you were saying before about like switching of metaphors, all yeah. of a sudden we have the word snowy, which seems really strange because we've just been in the molten sky. It's and been summer and suddenly there are snowy hats. And they're snowy because they're white, probably. A- angels right. uh, uh, angels it makes tend me to think wear of, white um, hats. Or like clouds or sort yeah. of like cloud type imagery. Yeah. Like I, I think of this se- section as like moving up even like beyond sky if mm-hmm. you're trying to keep with the same metaphors. But um, Seraphs are who? Um, like angels, angels, yeah, angels, and angel saints. figures. Um, uh, and then saints are running to windows. So what's what are the saints doing? They're sort of like they're in their quiet saint houses or whatever, and they hear some kind of commotion outside, maybe or yeah. you know they're already going to sleep, and then they run to the window because they hear someone outside. And the the angels are swinging their hats. I, I'm I'm they're swinging sw- my hat. It, the, the, we shall stipulate that I'm swinging my hat. So, I don't have a hat. I'm swinging an imaginary hat. I, I sort of picture them as cheering her on. Like, yeah, they might be like, right there with her. Who? Here comes Emily reeling down the street. Why are they <laughs> celebrating? Sort of the euphoric thing of, like, she's, I don't know, she's, she finally made it. Like, she, uh, she's he- up here with us. Or she got to a point where she's just celebrating the fact that she can do all of these really crazy, reeling, powerful things without actually being drunk. Yeah, it's ecstasy. She's, she's become, she's gotten herself high uh, through the reeling through figurations. Um, and so they run to the window to look, and the last two lines, which we're all going to do together. Oh, by the way, Till. Till seraphs. Why Till? Um, I would guess that it just, is some kind of like part of the ballad meter so that you put more of the focus on serifs rather okay, than that's good until it's, that's very that's clever but what about the meaning of till until Un, well until yeah well wh- how does that well the, the well, previous how, line is is yeah Anna? i shall but drink the more until until, until. Serifs, so, so i'm great. gonna drink and drink steve i would say yeah it's, it's not that she's gonna stop drinking when the serifs show up but it's she'll drink until the serifs show up right, mm-hmm. right. i'm just gonna keep doing up. this and keep doing this until a new figuration comes. And the new figuration is angels and saints mm-hmm. in a house, leaning out the window <laughs> and seeing what? The little tippler. Dave, who is that little tippler? That's the, the bee who was tipping back some liquor. The whole who? poem. Or the poem, the poet. The poet, the little tippler. Of course, Emily always figures herself to be a diminutive figure. So. She, her narrow hands gathering paradise. So you get these narrow little hands gathering this enormous thing. And here you have the little tippler. A tippler means what? I mean, it's a great word. Amaris? I, I think it just means like a inebriate or a debauchee. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm t- we use the word tipple, I think, to refer to tipping the bottle, someone who's got a little flask in their back pocket. And so the tippler is kind of a made-up word. It's the person who's always taking a lot of swigs. To see the little tippler, so the angels and the saints are leaning out the window to watch Emily returning home after her binge, and she's doing what? She's leaning against the dash sun dash. Max, what the hell is she doing? Well, it's it's like gathering the heavens with her narrow hands. She's doing something that's that's enormous and, and impossible and and almost godlike. First of all, why leaning? Well, because she's drunk. She's, yeah, when yeah. you're drunk, reeling through. <laughs> Inebri- Can I do my my drunk reading of this? Inebriate of air am I, and debauchee of do. Reeling through summer, endless summer days from inns of molten blue. Landlords, 
She's sort of make. Yeah, that's the ticket. I think I'll talk about metaphors of birds and bees and flowers. And landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's gore. When butterflies renounce their dream, I shall dr- drink the more till seraphs swing their snowy hats. And saints to windows run to see the little tippler, third person reference to herself. She is, in a way, in the position of Emily in the, in the house, in the little apartment. She's almost done, this is a little biographical reading, she's almost done a little, a little um, fantasy of herself going out on the town and then coming back. And she's there with the saints and seraphs looking at herself coming back, having written this poem, having done a flight of, ex- of figurative ecstasy to see the little tippler leaning against the, and now she's like, uh, leaning against the, uh, I don't know, what do you say, uh, sun. She picks this enormity, and you can lean against a post, and you can lean against a house and a door jam on your way back to fumble for your keys. But instead, Max, the sun. Say it again. Well, she's... She's up there in the heavens. I mean, it's, 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 she's drunk, reeling around, and just happens to find herself leaning on the largest, hottest body, <laughs> the most powerful thing in the, in the sky. The most powerful thing that cannot be leaned against by, by, humans, by any means. By any means. <laughs> would, would we say that, we, that, that the sun can't be extended to the SON? Well, there have been, yes, of course there are religious and indeed Christian readings of this poem, right. and that is totally good, except we haven't, we haven't done that here. Right. We focused on a meta, meta-poetic reading. Right. What I want to do is defer that for others who might want to elaborate that, simply in the interest of time. But it's been read that way, certainly. Sun, sun, pun, which is a pun on Jesus Christ and is right. a standard. Um, and of course, that's invited by the seraphs and the saints. Right. And in a way, be, this is. W- yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say that. I mean, in a way, in a way that I don't think necessarily <coughs> con- counter contradicts our reading. In a way, until the end of time, she is going to reel through nature, until the saints come marching in, and yeah. you know, at that point, she'll finally. Can, re- can rest because nature is no yeah, more. Yeah, that's very good. That's a good reading. All right, what I want to do is I want to go around and I want you to be really quick. We have stipulated, and then I argued in my discussion about the form of the poem enacting the poet's ecstasy and her abandoning figures as soon as she embraces them. We have so- kind of stipulated that this is a meta poem, that this is a poem about the art of writing poetry the way Emily does. What I want to do is invite each of you, if you want, to say one thing about its metapoetic quality. It can be a reference to a line or a phrase, or it can be some overall statement about why we think this is an ars poetica. This is a classic instance of Emily telling us how the imagination works for her. So why don't we start with Amaris, go all the way around. Say any, uh, did, did I give you enough time, Amaris? Do you have something you want to say? Um, something about its mo- metapoetic quality. I think just the rhythm, the way the metaphors sort of take off and the images it's like Dave was saying in the beginning it kind of gives you this impression of being taken along the journey with her and so the fact that she reaches the state of transcendence at the end the reader and the poet sort of become one in this metapoetic oh the reader and the poet yeah endorsement of and we in order to understand it we have to do some reeling ourselves we have to go along for the ride as it were okay Max metapoetic quality uh, yeah, just to go off what Amaris said about the that transcendent ending, I think it's 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 really like a, a, a tour de force, and she she attains, you know, she she rises into the heavens, she attains uh, the sun, she she's next to to, to power really, um, and yet she's this this diminutive, unassuming person who doesn't drink and is not experiencing nature's way of getting us loose. She knows how to get loose, and she doesn't need liquor. She's got poetry. The poem gets out of control. And the poem is so much more, in the end, a leaving of the evidence of the power of the imagination to send us places we would never go otherwise. Anna? Um, I think just the, the joy in the poem is what gets me. I mean, I, I, I think there's such a euphoria when you read this. 
that you get from her language, from how it all starts to just completely fall apart starting in the second stanza, how she's like kind of making up words and making up conceits, and she's just like... She's having a great time. She's having an awesome time. Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine one of us... It's a like party. Her. It's a total party, and that makes me <coughs> want to go take a shot and write a poem. <laughs> yeah. It does. Reading Emily Dickinson does no. make you want to try that. I mean, a nature. but I would also <laughs> Go say for a don't, walk don't try <laughs> don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, all right, Jason, quickly, uh, anything metapoetic that you see there? Yeah, well, I love I love the molten blue and in the way that it's it's both turning the sky almost into iron that can be poured into becoming anything. So it's melted, oh, fantastic, <laughs> melted, fantastic, and full of potential. If you want to go to some place. Where things are not clearly defined and things are fluid and move, go to the sky. Mm-hmm. You've got the clouds, you've got air. It's it's so she mo- in a way moves from definite to indefinite by going that way. That's that's terrific. Wow, Dave. The ending leading against the sun, she becomes ephemeral. She becomes omnipresent. She becomes almost like the the air and the summer days that just above she was reeling through. You know, Dave, uh, editors didn't like that ending. Why do you think not? Well, it, it looks like she's becoming unhinged a little bit. <laughs> she is a little kooky, and she's drunk, but what more pe- in a more pedestrian editorial oh, well, it way? It ends on a, on a dash. It ends on a dash with an impossible noun, the sun. You can't lean against the sun. And exactly. So do you know what the line is? Till Manzanilla come. What's Manzanilla? It's a... Um type of liquor like a spanish liquor it's i think spanish made from liquor. apples till manzanilla comes so you know that is a cheap way out isn't it and i can't believe they did that i mean talk about ruining someone's poem <laughs> she's clearly trying to be open and they were trying to be closed she, this is a this is an open ended poem this is a vintage open ended poem okay uh lily um well i guess the <laughs> the um the type of liquor that Emily's talking about, if we want to do a sort of metapoetic thing, um, is that it's not the kind of alcohol that you would drink and makes you less powerful or less in control. It makes you um, incredibly, it makes, it like really opens her up and, and makes her inc- both incredibly in control and able to just go wherever inspiration sort of takes her. And so I think she uses that metaphor really well to talk about her own poetic writing because she af- sort of like affirms her right to be able to do that. Lily, would you guess, I'm asking you an impossible biographical question okay. about composition, would you guess that Emily Dickinson was totally in control of being out of control, or in the state of composition was she in fact sharing some of the ecstasy and was out of control letting the metaphors run wild without really controlling it? Which do you think? What's your impulse? Um, my impulse would be that it's an... Um, affectation of loss of control. So it's but controlled, in fact, a- controlled uncontrol. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably right, although I like to think of Emily as loosening up a little bit. So, Steve? Uh, I love these double quotes. I love the absurd implication of the idea that the, the double quotes uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> mark off, oh, this is figurative language right here. Uh, <laughs> And here, drinks. The rest, is <laughs> the rest is literal, right? As if the whole, as if the whole thing wasn't, in fact, a big metaphor. Because she told us at the beginning that this is an impossible scenario. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really cool and, and really postmodern in a way. Sure. Oh, yeah. It makes me want to read more about the use of double quotes in the nineteenth yeah. century. Can you say in a word, since this anticipates later poetry that you know we're going to be talking about? Can you say something about the postmodernity of the double quotes? Uh, it brings you, brings you to the surface, certainly. Um, mm-hmm. Draws your your eye to the uh, F- and foregrounds the, the word as a word. Sure, that's right? true. Which is, of course, you know, even modernism in, in its most radical ways. I mean, H. D. really w- wanted us to think of her as writing about a sea rose. Mm-hmm. A rose is a rose is a rose, not a rose in quotes. And so, I think postmodernity is going to f- foreground even more so the word as a word. Any further thought on that? I think that about covers it. <laughs> Emily, final, final word. Um, we've been giving a lot of attention to the, the sort of divine registers of this poem, the sort of angelic emphasis. But I think what's maybe most interesting and, and sort of coolest about what she does in this poem is actually her attention to the more sort of pedestrian 
more pedestrian sort of metaphors. I would rather imagine Emily feeling herself drunk in some sort of gross, dirty bar than imagine her sort of sort of giving herself access to these sort of privileged divine places because we're used to poetry treating itself or being treated as this access to the sublime and sort of a a rarefied alternative to lived experience but suggesting that it's a true alternative to lived experience that poetry can both be this sort of sublime godly realm and this sort of coarse sort of bodily debauchery i think is more interesting and more unusual well said thank you all this was this was a lot of fun